And now, everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Brad Brarby. All right, how we doing? How you guys doing? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome. Welcome to everybody on campus, everybody that's watching online. My name is Brad Barbie, and I'm a course director here at Full Sail University. And I am your host today for this session titled Mixing Lil Uzi Votes, Verts, Ex Mixing Lil Uzi Verts, Exo Tour Life, and NERD's Lemon featuring Rihanna. Guys, put your hands together. Help me welcome our panelists today. Mix engineer and producer, Leslie Brathwaite. How's it going, man? Doing good. How you doing? So, uh, so um, you know, just kind of, some of us know your story, some of us don't know your story. Just give us the, you know, the bird's eye overview of how you started at Full Sail and how we wound up here on stage. Can y'all see me? Can y'all see me? I'll, I'll move over here a little bit so you can <laughs> see me. Um, so, hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> All right. So, um, I graduated from Full Sail in 1992. RA, don't, don't hate. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to be 45 in April. Um, yes, so I uh, graduated RA and um, loved uh, my experience here while I was in school, while I was a student. Um, went on to Atlanta, chose Atlanta at the time because I just felt like it was an exciting, growing market and drove up to Atlanta, interned couple of different studios at Bobby Brown Studios and at Dallas Austin Studios and worked my way up and went from being an intern to an assistant to a recording engineer to a mix engineer. And along the way, I do some producing. I produce still every now and then when I feel like it, but I love mixing. And um, I worked at DARP Studios, which is Dallas Austin Studios, for about 10 years and then transitioned over to Patchwork Studios, where I worked for another nine and a half, 10 years. And then um, all throughout the years, Akon and I um, had became friends. I'd mixed all of his records, and then we decided to open a studio together. So currently own a studio with Akon in Atlanta. Wow, nice. Um, just one quick question before we actually get into it, but you said that you know, mixing really appealed to you. What was it about everything audio related for some reason that mixing, you knew mixing was your lane? Uh, because the artists usually don't come. <laughs> no, um, just over the years of, of you know, recording and, and, you know, just exploring the different parts of audio, um, show pro and all that kind of stuff, I just, something spoke to me about mixing. It just, it seemed like it was my calling. I love being in an environment where it's just me and the music and taking something from nothing and making something that, that's very appealing and it's just... It's an intriguing process, and it's one of the, um, it just spoke to a very primal need to be creative, and we all share that, you know, creative need, and we, we express it in different ways, but that was the thing that just spoke to me. How much, how much of, of all the mixing you do, do you get things where it's just ready to go and you're just putting gingerbread on it versus something is, you know, really, really needs Dr. Brathwaite? Uh, we, we, we are more on the really, really need side. Um, <laughs> I will say, though, um, I, am, I consider myself to be just extremely lucky because for most of my career, I get to work with mostly very professional people. I've, I have the honor and privilege of working with people like Pharrell, and Pharrell is, you know, he's a consummate professional. He's, and his team are all professionals. They're all full sale grads, by the way. Mike Larson, um, Andrew Coleman... Um, and the way those guys send me sessions and prepare the sessions for me to mix is like, I wish I could just clone them yeah. and they could just be all my clients all yeah. the time. Um, they're just great. Um, they make my life easy. They make me look good because yeah. they send me great material and stuff that's very organized and I can just do my job. So um, that does not, however, um, apply to, let's say, 80-something percent of all my other clients. <laughs> So, you know, it's a nice balance, but no complaining here. I mean, who am I to complain, you know? Well, you know, and speaking of, you know, you said professional organized. I mean, oh, the sorry. two songs we're, uh, you know, we're here going to talk about today, you know, two big hits that are still going. 
What um, what do you got up first, and how you wanna how you wanna break it down? All right, let me scoot over a little bit. Sorry for my chair noises. And let's see. I'm gonna steal this from you, and I'm gonna come over here. And I'm gonna move my little drink over here, my full cell branded um, beverage. Yes. <laughs> and I'm gonna put this down here. Um, and at at the end, remind me. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a couple quick off-topic uh, things. So at the end, I want to I want to address the group and talk to you guys about two things. Y'all gonna remind me at the end? Yeah. Two, two things. things we got to talk about. Don't forget that. All right. So anyway, um, all right. Well, I guess we are starting with uh, the NERD song "Lemon" featuring Rihanna. Um, let me just start off by saying, when I got the call earlier, I actually got the call while I think I, I, I was either still here for Hall of Fame last year, or it was right after Hall of Fame, and I can't remember. But when I got the call from Pharrell to come out to LA and, and mix the NERD album, that was like a very, very exciting phone call, because I really, really wanted them to make another album, and I re I'm a huge fan of the group and what the freedom that Pharrell is allowed to have musically. So I was super excited when he called me to, you know, come mix the album. And for some reason, he just wanted me to come out to LA. He had just had three babies, he had triplets, and, you know, we were also mixing some of the um, Justin stuff, and so he wanted me to come out that way. But, um, so this is the, actually, this is the first song that we kind of started mixing when I got there. And when this kind of set the tone, and when I heard this record, I was excited. So. Um, you want me to just start walking you through it? Yeah, you want to you want to play you know a minute and a half of it? And sure, let's going? play a little bit of song so y'all can. For those of you who may not be up on pop culture and don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> who said that? You said you want to hear the rough? Yes, sir. Well, hold on, we ain't we ain't we ain't gonna do that yet. You know, we ain't gonna do that. So let me see what we got <laughs> going on here for us. I gotta see. Let's check the situation. Oh yeah, there we go. So this is Yeah, y'all want me to play the clean version, house? <laughs> I I think I should play the clean version. You know what we think this is gonna be, you know, stream. Should we and... quickly audio suite all the language out of it real quick? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's run with the clean. But y'all y'all curse. Y'all know what the curse words are. Don't act like, you know. <laughs> let's let's keep it. You know, let's keep it friendly. The more the, the cleaner it is, the more people will be able to watch this. So, you know, we cool with that. Y'all all right? All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Um... <laughs> Truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Hey, that wanna be my face. Hey, come and get like the CIA. Hey, sat in the car trying to see my face. Hey, want me to be the like the CIA. Oh, hey, if it's heated, I'm gonna be my face. Hey, you better believe it's gonna be our race. Hey, hey, can't believe my race. Hey, bitch, you bitch, you bitch, the heated like face. Oh, bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing. Bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing. Scrunching they as a young name and they mountain. Bouncing around. Bouncing around, bouncing. Hey, you keep messing with me where I'm from. Hey, I'm about to pour the same shit I run. Hey, keep messing how I feel about guns. There's a light and dark on me, which side you choose? Oh, hey, if not now, then when? Hey, and if not me, then who? Hey, don't drink the cool, lay my friends. Hey, I try to tell y'all about this dude. Bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing. Bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing. Hate self love and self found right in their couches. Right now. I get it how I live it. I live it how I get it. Come to my bitches. I pull it with a lemon. Not cause she ain't living. It's just the eyes get a city. And this ain't a scrimmage. We ain't finished. I told you we won't stop. And by the business. Like yours, but you're renting. Where's the love to the top? The bay wrong guy. And so on and so forth. <laughs> so. <laughs> So real, real quick, because there's so much going on in the session, uh -huh. like just like the, you know, the top level view of how, how do you have everything kind of organized in terms of 
session structure, like drums, vocals, like stems, things like that? Yeah, and I tend to, when I, when I look at a session, for me, um, I tend to like things, you know, I like things organized a certain way where I have like, usually the drums come, you know, I, I think from left to right and top to bottom. So, you know, if, if you're thinking of it spread out on a console, the drums would be first, Usually, sometimes the ba I'll keep the bass and the kick close to each other so I can always jump between the relationship of those two. Um, those are two of the more important elements in the mix is how does your kick drum react with your bass drum? How does your, you know, how does all the low end frequencies work together so that you can feel what you gotta feel, you gotta feel the knock, but you want the bass notes to come through. Um, and then I tend to have the lead vocals next or, you know, next in line and then all the backgrounds on the lower portion of the session. A lot of times it doesn't come to me that way. A lot of times the session will come super jumbled, nothing's labeled, nothing's color coded. And for me, I like to, I have a little bit of OCD. I like things to be color coded and organized and I don't necessarily have to name all the tracks. Sometimes it's pretty obvious what is on the tracks and when you've been doing it for a while, you can kind of look at a session and see, oh, that's a snare or you start, it, it starts to get super insane to the point where I know what a curse word looks like, the waveform of a certain <laughs> curse word. You know, you do it long enough, you'll figure that kind of stuff out. But, um, so I like to keep things organized, and what I always tell people is, and this is something that you all should note, being organized keeps you from making mistakes. It keeps you, you when you have a, a, a procedure, when you have a way of doing things, um, when you have some clean, clear train of thought about doing things. It just helps you not make mistakes. So it's a, it's a good habit to have. And it also helps when, if Rihanna's standing over my shoulder and the session looks so organized that she can tell where her vocals are and she can lean over me and be like, hey, can we mute this part? It, it, it eliminates a whole lot of um, communication when she can visually see where her vocals are and just point to it and say, hey, can we mute that part or can we, you know, so that helps too. And that's happened a lot of times. Did you always have that or did you, was there a certain point when you started working you saw that things were disorganized and you said, I'm going to develop that habit or did you just always kind of have that nature of always wanting to No, be always, meticulous? yeah, always had the habit of being organized even when, when we were working on tape machines or whatever the case may be, it was always like we used to have to write on the console with different, I used to have different colored Sharpies for different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a good practice to be organized, to have your tracks labeled and at least color coded so it just looks like it makes sense. Yeah. And it's just a better train of thought and a better way of thinking. And I see you had a question in the front. If you have a question at some point, I don't know when you guys want me to appropriate that, but there's... Uh, two microphones, one right here and one right there. In, you just get up and walk aisle. to the microphone, and then I'll we'll choose a time for you. Now we need we need you to go on the microphone. There or there. <laughs> when you record vo uh, when you record choruses, do you keep them all on the same channels so you know when you mix them down, it all stays the same? Like if you're dubbing them in between verses. Uh, I'm not or, sure I understand your question. Like, if you're recording somebody's chorus, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Are you going to put them on the same channels later on, you know, throughout the verses? Or do you put them on separate channels? Oh, if, if you're saying if I do, like, the first hook and then the same set of vocals on the second hook, do they come on the same tracks? Yes. Yeah, that just keeps life simple. Okay, word. So uh, here's, here's one to fit in here. You talked about the importance of that kick-bass relationship. Mm -hmm. Like, one thing that's crazy to me about this song, well, actually, like, uh, all the stuff you did on, on the Lil Uzi Vert, like, all the tracks on this, like, everything, the low end and the kick, there's so much separation, mm -hmm. but there's also so much detail from way, way down, you know, say, 30 and below all the way up, because you could listen to it here, and it sounds amazing, but I can listen to it on my iPhone. Like, how do you... Get that. And that's the important thing. You have to understand, you know, what you're mixing for, the genre, the, you know, you, you kind of try to think universally. People listen to records on their phones, on head, headset. Most people consume music on their headphones these days. And so it's just the awareness of understanding, okay, this has to work across multiple formats. And it's, it's, that's why it's important to have a set of speakers that can represent that in the most flat response way across a lot of different formats. Um, so 
let's solo out um, some of those sounds that you're talking about and get a sense of where did the where did the the bass line come from? Do you know like what machine it came from? I do not know that. Uh, this all this stuff just came to me in Pro Tools. It was already you know what I mean. He was yeah. He was doing his thing. So let's cool. see. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh wait, did I start from the right place? Nope. Mm -mm. Sorry. Uh, So here's one of the plugins I love to use on low end stuff. So it's called a, uh, it's made by Universal Audio, it's a UAD plugin. Um, this is a Pultec EQ. And what these were known for, the real unit, um, they, they, they're known for being uh, extremely warm. Mm -hmm. They process the sound in a very warm way. So automatically, sometimes you could just throw this EQ, this, uh, EQ on without even moving any of the settings, and you'll automatically hear some warmth. Yeah. And just because UAD is very good at modeling the real gear, and that was the case with the real gear. You would just turn it on and run the signal through it before you start turning the knobs, and you can feel the warmth already. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's really good. Um, anything from 30 to 60 hertz is where I usually like to use it, um, and it just really gives you a nice roundness and then the next uh, obvious thing would be to figure out what the kicks are doing, when they're doing it. So now we have a real low, low end joint right there. And I don't think the plugins came up here and I can't even remember what I used. I'm trying to see, what did I use? The Fairchild 670 Legacy and an EQ3 7 band. So I think if I'm not mistaken, the Fairchild, I probably did a light compression on that particular uh, instrument, that low end. And now the key is for that and the first sound to work together where they're not clashing. Mm -hmm. And so that second sound is really just about, some certain sounds are meant to be heard and certain sounds are meant to be felt. And so that's one of the main distinguishing qualities between when you're mixing is, a lot of your balancing is going to be based on what do you want to hear and what do you want to feel. And so that's when you kind of start making decisions about how much punch I'm going to add to a certain kick or how much EQ or how much volume. Volume, obviously, is usually the metric where you're, you're trying to find or, or use a sound that's going to be heard. And then EQing the hard frequencies and the kick and the punch, that's for the instruments that you want to be felt. How, how much are you chasing down like that fundamental frequency? Are you using like a spectrum analyzer and finding the fundamental and then no, um, tuning off or, or for, filtering off of that? For me, it's a lot of feel yeah. um, because what you have to do in any technical um, position or field is you got to remember you're dealing with music that ultimately you want to make people feel something. And so a lot of times what we tend to do all of us nerds, me included, is we, because we're technical and because we have gadgets and we like plugins and all of that stuff, we tend, to, our minds tend to stay in this very technical realm. And we don't, we tend to forget sometimes that music is about how it makes people feel. You know, the songs that you grew up knowing and loving, it was about how they made you feel. You know, Michael Jackson's Thriller, for me, that album made me feel some kind of way. Billie Jean and Beat It and all those records, Human Nature, they made me feel some kind of way. So as I'm doing a very technical job, I still have to remember my job is to make people feel something. So with that mind frame, when I'm, a lot of times I tell people, like people will come up to me and be like, you know, what frequency did you roll off of that kick? And I'll be like, man, I just turn the buttons till it sounds good. Like I don't be knowing, <laughs> I don't be knowing numbers and, dialing frequencies and because you can get too far in your head but how much how much do you not but i should say but mm. and how much are you trusting your monitors that you're using though so that you're hearing back accurately you right I mean? yeah you gotta you gotta pick some monitors that you trust that you know what you're hearing is accurate but it's a lot of feel it's a lot of a lot of it is and and i know a lot of professionals you know my, a lot of my colleagues a lot of my fellow hall of famers will tell you the same thing we just go in there sometimes we'll pull up a plug-in and just start turning the knob and then you would be like oh i like that 
And I don't remember what n number I'm on or what frequency I rolled off. I don't know. Are you dialing in low end with a sub, though? Do you, do you mix this kind of stuff when you're yes. working on this with a sub? So I use the, um, right now my setup is the uh, Focal, Focal or Focal, some people pronounce it differently, uh, Twin 6 BEs. Oh, nice. Very I use nice. those. And then I have a KRK sub. It's a 12-inch sub. And I picked the KRKs because A, the price point is great, and yep. B, you can really beat up that sub. Mm -hmm. you, can re you could drive that thing into the ground like it's a solid sub. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that setup, and yeah. And have, you ever, have you ever like compared a sealed sub to a ported sub, like in terms of yeah. the way your um, mixes come across? I tend to like ported subs a lot better because you, your sound is a lot more accurate. Mm -hmm. What you get is a lot more accurate when it comes to that low end. Cool. Hey, there's a guy out there. Question, green shorts. Hello. My name is Andre. Um, well, my, I have a sim simple question. How many tracks do you have in your session? Oh, this session right here? Yeah. I did not count them, but um, you can see, are you able to see them? This yeah. is the whole session right here. So everything in green is all the passes that I've printed, and that's the stuff that I'm sending to mastering. Those files are what's going to mastering. Everything that starts right here in the brownish color and then okay. all the way. So these are all the instruments. And then everything in red are lead vocals. The vocals that you see right here that are muted, those are Pharrell's vocals. There's a version of the song where Pharrell does the rap instead of Rihanna. All right. And then... Um, 79. There's 79 <laughs> tracks on this You section. counted? They're, they're track numbers on the uh, left. Y'all want to hear the uh, Pharrell uh, rap? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all just want to say y'all heard something exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just a uh, side note, too, he did the, obviously, he did the rap first, and, and not obviously, but this is how it worked. He did the rap, and then she rapped over his vocal so she could get the cadence and, and feel oh, of cool. it, and then we took him off, obviously, so... If you wonder why Rihanna sound like she's spitting bars, that's why. So let me it's unmute. Like Magician's Secrets Revealed. Right. right. Oh, wait, hold on. I might not even have to do all that. I might actually have... Nope. I don't have that version. All right, so yeah, I do got to unmute it. Hold on. Let's do that. And, and I'm only operating with one hand here, so I ain't got all my quick <laughs> keys, and don't be, yeah, don't be clowning me. All right, let's see what y'all got. Man, ethnic right now. I get it how I live it. I live it how I get it. Count the motherfucking digits. I pull up with a lemon. Not cause she ain't living. This is your eyes get acidic, and this ain't a scrimmage. Motherfucker, we ain't finished. I told you we won't stop. A nigga by the business. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for all the profanity. I'm gonna hear about it later. <laughs> on on that note, with you know, with the with the vocal leveling, how much when you get sessions or when you had this session, who was the mix engineer for this? Do you know? Me. Not mix engineer, tracking engineer. I was like, I was like is sorry. that a trick Where question? Are we again? <laughs> I was like, well, wait a minute. Sorry. I'm sorry, what's your name? No. <laughs> the tracking engineer was Mike Larson. Mike Larson, okay, mm -hmm. cool. So, um, how much once you get it and start mixing, are you finessing automation levels or is it, is it a lot of that leveled out when you get it? A lot of it is very leveled out when I get it. The, the thing about it, the process of mixing Pharrell's records are probably a lot different from most of the other records I mix because Mike and Pharrell get a pretty dialed in sound as to what they want, how they want the, um, excuse me, how they want the activity of the song to be. So all of the level movements and that kind of stuff as far as 
things that might be a little dynamic in the vocals uh, as far as if Pharrell yells and he wants a certain dynamic um, interpretation of that. A lot of that is already there. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of what I'm controlling when I'm mixing Pharrell's records is just how it knocks, how things relate to each other. I, have a, I, I would do an overall direction of how I want the vocal to sit on the track, yep. loud yep. or soft. But a lot of it is just coming in and making exactly where they are, just enhancing it and making, making it really, really hit and knock yeah. and you know, cleaning up some of the, the gunk. But a lot of it just comes to me exactly. I know what Pharrell is thinking when he sends it to me, and I, 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 I can tell the vision he's trying to get to, and then it's just my job to get it there. Well, with, to, with, to your credit, too, your ability, from just my perspective, I usually monitor on a pair of Equator D5s, and I have an SRS sealed 12-inch sub, 400-watt 12-inch sub. Mm -hmm. So listening to NERD and then listening to all the little Uzi Vert stuff, like all the stuff that you mixed on NERD and all the stuff that you mixed on Lil Uzi Vert, the... the way that you not only, like I said before, you, you get the bass and the kick to have this like crazy relationship, but the clarity is unsurpassed in listening to other mixes that other people have done. And then the vocal way forward, and then just like this magic space that hovers around everything. And so, I mean, that's to your credit, because you say, oh, it sounds good when you get it, but you do your thing, yeah, you know? A, yeah, and it's about really, that's the thing. It's about, there's, there's a lot of magic there, and then now I have to take the magic, pull it out, and, and somehow make you feel it. Yeah, exactly. And it's about those levels. It's about making sure that if there's a kick in there, the kick got to hit. Yeah. And it, you got to feel a certain, you got to feel like you want to move. You, the, the, the whole purpose of a lot of groove um, type tracks is I want people who... The, you, you want people to walk away listening to something. You know how sometimes you listen to something and you just inadvertently just start nodding your head or moving and you you kind of not even controlling it? Yeah. That's what you want from people. You want the feel to take over. You don't yeah. want them to be in their brain about something. You want them to just like yeah. it. Like yeah, they're in, in their subconscious. Yeah, like when sense. I was a kid yeah. and I was singing, you know, Michael Jackson songs, I didn't know what he was saying. Like... Mama say, Mama say, whatever. Like I, we was all singing the wrong lyrics to a bunch of songs. But it feels so good. But it felt good, and <laughs> yeah. that's what you want. You want that feel. Got another question on the side over here. Go ahead. Hey, how you doing, I'm Miles? Yes, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is how you approach um, your drum bus as far as processing goes, and then when do you decide you do parallel processing, and when would you not? Um, parallel processing usually only occurs when I'm really trying to fix something or it's very um, prominent in EDM stuff. And for those of you who may not know what parallel processing is, it's simply using the, the key input of a certain sound. So for instance, you know, when you're listening to a EDM or drum and bass record and you hear the kick hitting and it's like, oops, oops, oops. and every time the kick hits, all the other instruments or the bass dips. It takes like a little dip and it kind of wow, 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 wow. That kind of. Can we I, sample that real quick? Right. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I need publishing for my joint. Yeah, exactly. Um, Copyright 20. But yeah. <laughs> but um, so that is what, you know, that is the, the parallel processing is when one sound is affecting the knock and the hit of another sound. Um, so. I don't use it much in, in genres like a lot of pop stuff and a lot of hip-hop stuff and R&B stuff. It's not very prevalent. Um, I don't rely on it much. And as far as my drum buses and, and processing, um, I like to, here's the thing. I don't, when I mix, as you can see, hold on, let me show you. So I tend, and again, mixing Pharrell's records are a little different than most of the other records I mix. When I mix, I usually have all the instruments coming out of one bus. For me, what that does is it forces me to be committed to certain decisions. Because if you have the drums grouped, and you have the guitars grouped, and you have the so-and-so grouped, just your brain is programmed to always want to change something. Your brain is programmed to always be like, let me turn the drums up a little bit. <laughs> Or let me turn the guitars down a little bit. As opposed to if everything is coming out of one bus, 
your decisions are a lot more organic and you're forced to kind of make everything work through that one bus, if that makes sense. Do you set up a certain way on that, on your mix bus? Like, do you set, open up a session and say, I'm putting this on my mix bus? Or do you just start with I, I kind of start, yeah, I start with what's there. And a lot of times I try to, we all have ways and methods and things that we do. And so I try to, there's certain things that I do similar when I'm, when I'm mixing, but I also try to keep an open mind. Sure. And you got to remember that each creation is different, each song is different. And I don't want to get too rigid in my thinking and right. be like, it has to be this way and it has to be that way. So it's kind of like, you know, I put on shoes every day, but I don't wear the same shoes every day. So you got to keep an open mind about a process that you, you do the same thing every day, but still keep an open mind about the actual thing. So if you wear two different shoes, that's like parallel walking, right? Exactly. But on, on the note of like, if you're not putting the processing on the drum bus, like say for like vocals, do you find yourself having like multiple, do you copy out a vocal and then process those two vocals no, differently? No, no, It's always no. just you yeah, run I, with I, one? I try to force my, my train of thought to be very simple. Like this is what I'm doing to the lead and that's it. I don't want to have to like, I don't want too many choices. Because then I, you, you, you will get into the zone of second-guessing yourself on different things. And when you have the access to second-guess yourself, it's, it's kind of like this. If, let's say we had a feature on our cars that you could push a button and change the color of your car every day. I would never leave the house. Yeah. I would be, be in the garage going, purple, nope. Yeah. Black today, nope. White today. But yeah. my, my truck is white, and it's going to be white, and yeah. I don't have to make that decision. Yeah. So... <laughs> Just yeah. keep, keep hitting the button. Yeah. Um, because we still want to be able to get into um, XO Tour Life too. Um, what would you say just are, are the top couple things in terms of vocal processing that you did in here where when you hit the sweet spot, you knew that that um, was it? Yeah, and like with most of his records, I keep the vocals in your face. I want right. Rihanna, I wanted her to come off like she was a rapper. Yeah, she I did. Want, we did some time correction and, and, she, and it wasn't much. She, she has a natural, she's talented. But I wanted her to come off like, if you never heard Rihanna in your life, you would think she was a rapper. Yeah. And, so you know, when, when you did that, when you're saying you did some time, were you doing elastic audio and, and no, just, or were just, you just, just cutting shifting. and moving? Yeah, just cutting. Things? And I might shift the word here and there. Like, I remember in this particular area, give you some little secrets. Um, let's see, right off in here, let's go back to Riri. Uh, where is Riri? Let's cut that. All right, so. Just waiting from a song like the fawns. Woo! This beat tastes like lunch, but it's running from veneers and it's running from the front. That line right there when she said the beat tastes like lunch, she was slightly off on some of the words. And that's one of those things, like, if you feel it and you, you hear it, like. Woo! This beat tastes like lunch, but it's running from veneers and it's running from the front. That got to be in pocket because it's like. You know, she's yeah. she, she swagging it out right there. You got you to gotta feel that. You yeah. know, it can't be, words can't be a slightly off and sound like she's tripping over herself. Now, so. now just one, one thing about that mm -hmm. in, in terms of being able to use, and not to go too, like, Pro Tools technical, but, um, in, you know, when you can play, basically hit playback and then hit the down arrow to set your insertion before you stop playback, mm -hmm. are, you, are you doing that to, to find where you want that vocal to hit, or are you just nudging it, sliding it back? Just a feel. It? Okay. Yeah, just nudging. Yeah, I just cool. cut. Nudge and and a lot of times you'll see me do this a lot of times if you ever were around me in the studio. Lawrence, um, young man right here who's my intern right now, uh, recent grad. Stand up, Lawrence. Let everybody see who you are. <laughs> he he's got the dope sauce. Y'all should ask him some questions. He's he's dope. But uh, Lawrence have since he's seen me do it all the time in the studio where I listen to music and I close my eyes, and that's because. It's a feel thing. Again, I keep reverting back to, so a lot of times I'll listen and I'll close my eyes and I'll be like, nah, that didn't feel right. And then I'll nudge it a little bit and I'll listen because it's all feel. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm closing my eyes. I don't want my eyes. A lot of times what we do as young um, students and young um, learners of Pro Tools and engineering is we tend to rely on our eyes a lot and we look in and we're looking for the levels and we're looking to see where the waveform lines up with the grid and all that. Trust your ears. Let, let, you want to take one more uh, sure. lemon question, and then we'll go to Uzi Vert. Um, my name is Braylon. Uh, I noticed that you have certain tracks in stereo, uh, i.e. your bass and your kick. Uh, I was always told, you know, certain instruments need to be in mono, you know, to reserve headroom and, you know, just to 
put, keep space in the mix. Um, how, how is it that you're, I don't know how to really ask this. I think I, well, I, think you, I know what you're you know, asking. Yeah, yeah. But the first, part, first thing is, um, there's no absolutes in creativity. And so when somebody tells you you need to have something a certain way, it's more so, there's, there's a million different ways to do this. And it's ideal to have a mono sound on one track. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes the bass may have some stereo quality to it. Or having it on a, a stereo track, even if it's a mono sound, might give me the ability or might inspire me to pan both sides out and do something tricky to one side. And they're in creating some type of a stereo illusion or effect. Okay. So there's no rules. There's no, you need to have a mono sound right, on one right, track. Right. You know, th I, that's not a, that's not a, in my opinion, that's not a good mindset to have about creativity. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, bust that myth, you know, so. Yeah. Do, do you find sometimes, though, if you, if you push that stereo image too wide on a bass track when you reference to another system that somehow the bass falls apart and you got to bring it back in some? Um, yeah, and there's certain instruments I think we are, as human beings, as rhythmic creatures, um, we are innately programmed to hear a certain way. And in most cases, we want our bass and our kicks dead center because that's what's driving the beat. And so there are times when there are things that might be panned hard right, hard, hard left that have a little stereo quality to them or whatever, but it just depends. But I, if I feel like it will fall apart doing it that way, I keep them both to the center. Yeah. And sometimes I'll just keep them both just because. Like, it, nothing's overloading, nothing's distorting. It's okay. Cool. You, you want to jump into the little Uzi Vert track? Sure. Did anybody have any other questions about this particular track? Yeah. That they um, wanted to get? What, so hold on. Um, that young man was in line. For, <laughs> and then let's get a question from this side. <laughs> hey, how you doing? My name is Brandon Johnson. Um, so just out of curiosity, what problems did you occur while mixing either this track or even the uh, Uzi Vert track? Um, what problems did you have in mixing? How did you conquer? Um, different things like that, just the whole troublesome of it. Okay. For this song, um, I wouldn't say there were any problems per se. One of the areas of concern and one of the areas that I probably spent the most time on was what we started with, with that um, kick, um, low end, that all of this stuff, the 808s, and then let me put the kick in there too so you can kind of hear what all the low end stuff is doing. Um, and then... Let's do it on Rihanna's verse, because it's the most popular part of the song. So this relationship right here with that kick. And that 808 is really acting as the bass. Yeah. And then the sub 808 is just acting as something to give you a little, you know, it's really to bottom it out. And then you got the kick. And so, not that it was a problem, but it was, if I had to point out the area that I focused on the most in this song, it was that. Making sure that relationship was right so that no frequencies got canceled out in there, nothing was tying up, and you can really feel the hit every time. Because when you're dancing, you don't want to feel like there was a lapse in the hit. It actually, there's a Meek Mill song, and I cannot remember which song it is, where the kick and the 808 cancels out sometimes, and it drives me insane. <laughs> like, and I cannot remember which record it is. It's not one of his more popular records. He ain't got that many popular records. But that's a... It's an argument for a different day, but free Meek Mill, though. I ain't hating, I'm just saying. So, so Drink um, one that, y'all yeah, know that. So just kind of shifting, shifting gears a little bit, how, how, did the, how did the Uzi Vert project come your way? Um, Uzi Vert, so uh, he is signed to um, a producer, DJ, record exec, and probably the most important, uh, a dear friend of mine, his name is DJ Don Cannon. Um, him and another DJ by the name of DJ, uh, DJ Drama. Drama used to be my intern back in the day, and me and him have maintained our relationship throughout the years, and Cannon, I would mix a lot of the Gangsta Grill stuff over the years, and one day DJ Don Cannon called me and was like, yo, I got this new artist, we, we're doing Generation Now, and I got this artist, you know, Les, I think, you know, he, he connects with the kids, man. He's a star. 
And he was like, I'm gonna bring him by to meet you. We're gonna, you know, mix these records. I was like, cool. And the minute I met Uzi, I was like, he's a star. And I hadn't seen that type of energy in a while. And it's the, it's the kind of thing that it didn't appeal to me, but I know it when I see it. I'm, I'm about to be 45, so that kind of thing isn't supposed to appeal to me. Right. But I know a star when I see it, and I know authenticity when I see it. And the same thing I see, this is, might sound like a weird um, statement, but the same thing I see in Uzi is kind of the same thing you see in a Cardi B or anybody where Cardi B, as ratchet and ghetto as she is, she's authentic. And you can see authenticity. You can't fake that. Yep. And so with Uzi, I saw authenticity. I saw something pretty special with that kid. And, you know, when I first got his music, like I said, I didn't identify with it. I was like, oh, my God, some of the vocals are offbeat and there's a lot of reverb and, you know, all this stuff. But he was, like, very adamant about, like, keep my vocals sounding just like that. And I called him back one time. I was like, bro, the hook kind of off. Like, you good? And he was like, man, I like that offbeat. And I was like, all right. <laughs> cool, cool. Cool. Now, do you have that session with you? I do. Um, I guess we should find that. I'll take another question while I'm opening that session. Uh, no, your turn. Hello, everybody. My name is Favor. Hi, Leslie. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, what are the fundamental things you do before you start any session or your day? Like, what, what do you do to get prepared mentally? Uh, first thing I do when I get to the studio, I usually play video games. Um, I'm usually, I, I, I rotate between, how about we pull up the clean mix so I don't have no problems. <laughs> Y'all yeah, know what the curse words are, I don't act like. <laughs> I'm trying to make this family friendly. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I come in, I just, the thing about this, the, the creativity of what we do, and you know, it's fun, and it's a fun, job and you want to keep it fun and you want to keep it light and you want to keep things at a fun pace so you don't want to um you don't want to come in and be stressed and you know so first thing i do i play some video games i play madden call of duty battlefield uh any i mean if you want to if y'all want to see me on that madden you know let me know i i, I hand out l's ask lawrence <laughs> ask him ask lawrence I'll be handing out them L's. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Nah, I ain't, I ain't about that 2K life. I just, I'm not a basketball fan. Basketball players be whining too much. Um, so, um, yeah, so I play video games. Do, you know, you just, I take a lot of breaks when I mix just to kind of help ease my ears and my mind and, you know, just do anything you can. And some days I come in, and I'll be honest, some days I come in the studio and I do not feel like mixing. Or I might be in a slightly bad mood. I try not to be in a bad mood. Um, I, I'm, I consider myself usually in a good mood. But sometimes you just don't feel like it. But that's the thing that separates a professional from an amateur. Amateurs can't do their jobs when they feel stressed or they don't feel like it. A professional has to do their job whether they feel like it or not. And when you think about that, somebody asked me that question yesterday about mixing stuff that I don't like or when I don't feel like it and I don't feel in the mood. Imagine if you get on an airplane and that pilot don't feel like it. Or that air traffic controller don't feel like it. You see what I'm saying? So it's about you want professionals handling your stuff. And you want to be that way. When you're handling somebody else's stuff, you want to be a professional. You don't want the fact that you don't feel like it to affect your work. Because if the fact that that pilot don't feel like it affects his work, we got problems. You know what I mean? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what was, the, what was the condition of this session when you got it? Um, this session was pretty decent, pretty organized. It was pretty much looking like this. Um, I, as you can see, my color coding is a little different, and I don't know why. I think I was just, just trying to get through it. I was like, let me just mix this record. And you know, sometimes, you know, I, I like Uzi, don't get me wrong. Love Uzi. But all of my friends are not dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, let me just play this record for y'all. I'm sure y'all know the record, but we're gonna just have a little fun real quick. Um, Yes, I'm playing the, the clean mix. Uh, let's see here, make sure the outputs are right. Mm -hmm. 
boom. Let's see what we got. I don't know what he said just right then. <laughs> I don't really care if you cry. I don't really shouldn't have a lie. Should have saw the way she looked me in my eyes. She said, baby, I am not afraid to die. Push me to the edge. All my friends are dead. Push me to the edge. All my friends are dead. Push me to the edge. All my friends are dead. Push me to the edge. Phantom, that's all right. It's an all white. That's how then you ride a sled. I just want that. My brain, I'm mad. I'm really a man, no. Real talk. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Real talk. Real talk. Real talk. That's how then you ride a sled. I just want that. My brain, I'm mad. I'm really a man, no. What did he just say? So that's all I'm saying. Anyway, we know how the song goes. Um, so yeah, that's the record. Um, we um, had a conversation again. It's important when you get a record um, and you're about to mix the record, you have a conversation with um, the visionary of the record. A lot of times it's the producer, sometimes it's the artist, sometimes it's both. Sometimes you get in 10 different directions. Sometimes the a the label, and the producer and the artist all on different pages. And it's my job to then play psychologist first and then figure out how to be a mix engineer and figure out who to cater to and what comments make sense and what comments don't make sense. And usually I cater to whoever's paying me, so the label usually wins. <laughs> so, um, no, that's not true. Um, but sometimes. So you, you mixed like, like half the tracks off the album that this was on, right? Yes. Pretty much half of the I album. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was, um, did you have kind of a... Do you just go, I know we kind of covered this before, but do you go in with an idea of how, if you're doing the whole, whole album or you know you're doing this number of tracks, you're going for like a, like a seamless connection between, or just, did it just come out that they all kind of carried that same character to them? Um, excuse me. More so it's about trying to fit into what they have going on. So if I know I'm only mixing half the album, my first question is, can I hear the other half? Or will there be an opportunity to hear what everybody else is doing to, to just make sure I'm fitting in. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm the driving force of what everybody else is gonna be making their sound sound like, which in this part of my career is usually, usually the case because I'm mixing the singles. I know that when they come to me with certain budgets, okay, these are probably gonna be the singles. If they only come to me with half the album, it's probably because their budget only allows for me to mix half the album and they have to get somebody else to mix, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, and I know I'm driving the, the sound of the record and having conversations with Cannon and Uzi and figuring out what they want. And the first conversation, like I said, I had with Uzi is he really wanted his vocals to stay exactly like he sent them. He didn't want me to change the reverbs and the timing of the um, records. I felt like he, he's very ahead of the beat a lot of times and he likes that and he didn't want me to change that. And so that's something I have to honor and respect even though I don't like that and that's not my taste. I have to honor his art and what he's trying to convey to his audience. What, what's, did it feel more challenging or easier to have those kind of restrictions show up along the way? Did you still feel like, no, but that should sit back a little no, more? No, I don't, I don't let my ego get in the way. I don't, it, I don't worry about what I want or like. It's right. actually easier because when I know exactly what you want and I know you don't want me to mess with any of the reverbs, then that's just one thing less I got to do. So, yeah. you know, it's actually easier. And it's easy for me to get out of my own way as far as like worrying about well, I want it to sound this way. It's about what he wants at the end right. of the day. It's his song, it's his product, and he's the one that has to perform it. And, you know, so I have a sure. job to do. Sure. So, you know? Yeah. Question. Um, uh, <clears throat> Hello, my name is Devin. Um, I got like two questions. All right, the first one is like, when you send off their final mix to them to, them to listen to, and they like want tweaks and stuff, like how, do you give them a certain number of tweaks or like you just do it till they feel happy with it or? Um, yeah, the, the goal is everybody needs to leave the room a thousand percent happy. Now, there are some limitations too. Okay. We're not going to be doing, you know, 50 <laughs> million changes. Yeah. You know, you got to cut a check for that. Like, you, yeah. know, you know, so it's, I, the thing is to be fair and, and 
I'm not going to nail every mix every time the exact way this person wants. And it is about a collaboration. And it is coming in and saying, hey, well, let's try this or let's try that. If I feel like somebody is either trying to take advantage of my time mm -hmm. or they just plain out don't know what they want and we have a little too much back and forth, then we start having conversations about, hey, man, okay, yeah. if you want another set of changes next week, you know, we might have to talk about paying for some more studio time or paying me for my time. It, it rarely happens. We are usually able to, you know, collaborate and Have you had to have to... that conversation before, though? Yes. Is that an awkward conversation? No. <laughs> Not at all. No, it's good. Yeah. Yes, that's never good. awkward when it comes to money for me. I'm, hey, I need Dude, to Dude, some people react money. In, a, in a defensive sure. way to that. Sure, thing. I've had a, you know what's funny? And this is so sad, but it's always the gospel people. Oh, that'd be, that'd be take me to church, huh? <laughs> huh? What? <Well>, what? <laughs> I'm just saying. That's what I'm speaking truth. I'm good. Ain't no lightning bolts coming down here because I'm speaking the truth. <laughs> it's always the gospel people that are so difficult to work with, and I don't know why. And it bothers me because you would think the opposite, but they are always the ones who get, they wanna change 50 million things and they have the smallest budgets. And it's, so sometimes I, I have in the past had those kind of conversations with many of the gospel artists that I've worked with, is for, you know. Um, let's take his question. Yes. One question, man. Since you're getting like Pharrell, Lil Uzi Vert, you know how Pharrell's a producer and all. Are you having to, you know, mix his beats too as well? Is he sending you raw, raw beats, you know, like raw instrumentals? That happens sometimes. Like if he wants to play, like there'll be times when um, for Rihanna's album, he wanted, he knew she was coming to listen to some beats. Yeah. And he shot me some tracks real quick to no. beef up and make sure he, I just when he wasn't plays sure them. if, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they do it like that or if it's, you know, already sent 100% from a producer or whatever, you know? Yeah, no, sometimes he'll ask me to mix his beats. Did, yeah. did you mix Do It off the Despicable yes. Me 3? Yes. That's a great song. Yep. That's a great song. <laughs> Thank you. So, what, what was the big, what was the big hang up? In the, was there any hang up in this song? Was there any particular thing about getting this thing to sit together the right way? With Uzi's, with Uzi's records, the one thing that sometimes I struggle with, and I think I figured it out now. I think I used to struggle with it when I first started mixing his records. Um, I cannot remember the first record I mixed for him. I believe it was on an album called Money Longer, or maybe that was the song name, or I don't know. It was something like that. But he has some very <laughs> distinct nasal frequencies at times. And the, the issue with nasal frequencies, people who have very nasal voices, uh, Erica ba Badu comes to mind immediately because I used to have the same problem with her, is sometimes it's hard to work through the frequencies because a lot of instruments can tend to sit in those frequencies as well. Mm -hmm. And you gotta kind of make that distinction to it because you're still trying to bring across this certain feel and you want the song to hit a certain way. So in the beginning, it was a little challenging working with his vocal at certain points, but I got used to it and it kind of always made sense in a sense of understanding where his frequencies need to be. And I would go in and there would be, and I'm wondering if I did it on this song. I feel like by the time I got to this record, uh, that might is actually it, be saturation or like de or like what these is the frequencies that, right okay. in here. So these these frequencies that I notched out right here, like right here. Um, sometimes it's just these things that are happening that I, you see. I have to kind of grab them and just pull them down a bit mm -hmm. and notch them out. And a lot of times the way I would find those frequencies is I would do the exact opposite. I would um, bring the notch in and I would push it all the way up and sweep across and figure out. What frequency is really annoying, of, yeah. and then I would pull it down. And, so you're and like subtractively EQing exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. I, do, I do a lot of subtractive EQ, and I'm one of those people who feel like you will come up with a better sound every time if you take away a sound first or take away the things you don't like first than if you just walk in and start to add. And I always make the, the analogy, like, if you're about to clean the room, you don't just start cleaning the surfaces. You remove the trash first. You take the things out of the room that you don't like, and then you start cleaning up the sound. So I, lo I love the idea of removing what you don't like first and mm -hmm. then figuring it out from there. Cool. Take a question. Green shorts again. I see what you did. You went on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Slick. I like that. And I, it was an aisle change. It's Real slick. It's important to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, 
my question is, before you even started mixing the song, what was the feeling that you wanted to give for your listeners? Like, what was your vision before you even started to give, uh, before you even started mixing the song? Um, you, you want people to have, you want to listen to the record and understand what kind of record it is, and you want people to feel what you think they're supposed to feel. So when I heard this record, I was like, oh, they got to be able to dance to it and jam to it. And, you know, okay. and it's more so important, less what I think, it's more so important what Uzi thought and what Cannon thought. Those are the people who hired me to mix the record. So it's important to take in, even though they're hiring me for my talent and what I can bring to it, I still need to take what they want into consideration and understand that my job is to translate what they want. Okay. And what, uh, what were they thinking about? Uh, just making it hit and making people want to move to it. Okay. Making people want to dance. All right. Okay. Thank you. Now, did you, did you mix this at, at your studio or did you go to another studio to mix um, this? So this song I mixed at my studio. Um, the, Ner the NERD um, Lemon song I mixed in L.A. Okay. And that was just a product of uh, most of Pharrell's songs I mix at my studio. That was just, you know, the prison of the moment. We were also mixing some Justin stuff, and Justin sure. wanted to come to the sessions, and Pharrell had just had three babies. So he was like, well, why don't you come out on the West Coast and we'll do this, you know, album. Yeah. But most of the times I mix stuff in my studio. So cool. this was definitely... How, how, how long did it take you to get, like, your studio to the point where... I mean, do you still think about making enhancements or changes to your mix no. setup? Or yeah, no, I'm like, good. How long did it take you to get to that spot where you felt like you didn't have to think about that stuff anymore? About a week. Oh, it good. usually takes me yeah. about a few days to really lock into a space and love a space. Yeah. You know, like, and, and what's funny is um, inadvertently, like, even when I, when I come on campus here and I'm mixing in Darren's room, mm -hmm. Darren's room is a lot smaller than my room, but I love the sound I, I get out of that room. And it took me... Maybe about three, four nights to get used to that room, and I was jamming. I can come yeah. here and mix anytime I want now. Yeah. So when did you when did you set up your home base at your own studio? Now at yours, like how long have you been set up there? We have mixing? been in that building for about maybe two and a half, three years now. And how long of a like in terms of a vision? Let's say from the time that you first got out, left Full Sail, got into Atlanta, like that thing happening of you getting your own studio and being like, if you back that up in terms of like vision, did it take you longer to get there than you thought? Honestly, when I graduated from Full Sail and all throughout my career at DARP, at Dallas Studio for the first 10 years and at Patchwork for another 10 years, I never wanted my own studio. <laughs> like, I, I, I always wanted to re remain in the creative realm and I've always been of the mind frame that you know, you get a studio, and then you got to hire somebody to answer the phones, and then you got to hire somebody to do this, and before you know it, you have employees, and then when you have employees, their problems are your problems, and, you know, it's just, yeah. it's all this stuff, and I just, I never wanted to think about all of that stuff. I never, and I, I actually, there was one point where, I think it was in, might have been in 04, I had, we, I bought some land, and I started building a building, and the process that that took me through, I had to go to the city, I had to get zoning, and then I had to get rezoned, and then they had to come test the earth, and I was like, I'm done, like, I'm over it. I'm like, I didn't even know all this exists. Like, we right. didn't test the earth, it's the ground. Like, what you gotta, Yeah. and I was just <laughs> dirty. <laughs> I was over it, I was done. I was like, you know what, I wanna go back in the studio and mix records, I don't wanna do this. And you know, you gotta go to the zoning office, and you gotta stand in line, and it was too much, so. Because I don't like those type of processes, right. I ran from it for a long time. And this situation made sense for my personality because the studio that me and Akon uh, occupy, we rent the space. We actually lease the space from a friend of mine who she used to be my assistant, my executive assistant. Okay. And her and her husband, you know, throughout the years came up. She used to assist like a lot of different people like in sync and doing a lot of administrative work. And she came up and then she bought this property and bought the building. So I don't have to own the oh, building wow. and deal with all the ownership problems. Right. So like when the roof is leaking or the sewer breaks, not my problem. <laughs> so, so it's a, yeah. it's a match made. So in it heaven, just, yeah. yeah, it works out for my personality because I'm just not set up to, I'm, when, when I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to do what I do and make a decent living and make some money on top of that. And when you have an unlimited budget, you make, like, I, I'm the kind of person, like, if the roof is leaking, I'll just go buy a whole new building. Like, I just don't have time for this. Like, I don't want to. Right. I, I'm bad at, like, fixing problems. I, right. I, you know, so my wife could tell you, you know. 
Like, I might show up in Atlanta and be like, babe, I bought a house in Orlando. And she'd be like, what'd you do? You know, like, so. Right, right. I'm not allowed to you handle grab big another budgets. Question? Hi, my name's Evan. Um, when you're doing, like, bass-heavy music, when you're trying to get the kick in the uh, 808 relationship right, do you tend to um, mix quieter or louder when you're putting the final touches on? Like, that is a very good question. Um, I usually start off loud just to see where the problems are, because usually with bass-related issues like kick and bass relationship, mm -hmm. you need it to be loud to figure out what the real issue is, and then I correct the issue by listening pretty low. Okay. Once I figure out what the issue is, I don't need to listen loud all the time. Now, when oh, you thanks. say loud, when you say loud, do, do you ever you know, get to the point where you get the SPL meter out and say, okay, if I am listening at this level, I know I'm listening at 85 dB or 90 dB in the room? Or no, nah, I'm, ne I'm never that notes? technical. I'm just like, if, it, if my head hurt, it's too loud. I just, you know, I'm just, I'm very organic with it. I just, oh, yeah, because, uh, you know, some people get super technical. About yeah, it, no, I'm not, I mean? I'm not that guy. But, so, and then, <laughs> but in terms of especially kick bass, is your sub always on? Or yes. you get the level, so you're always Sub is always on. Okay. Sub is always on. Yeah. What do you, what do you, are you have a monitor, monitor controller? Or are you going through a desk? Like, how do you control I, your monitor subwoofer? So literally, my setup is one of these to a computer, and my um, analog to digital conversion is a um, Apogee Symphony, and then the speakers, and that's it. So you you have a manual control of your subwoofer? Y yeah, to yeah, balance, yeah. A, um, or is it calibrated to your monitors? Uh, it's, it's a controller, and okay. it, all it does is just, I'll be able to turn it off. It is calibrated. What's the name, Lawrence, what's the name of that unit that we use? The, um, the Dangerous. Dangerous, there you go. okay. Okay, like a two yeah. bus or something like that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good assistant. He knew something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Lawrence, hey. I was low-key testing you, though, just to see if you knew. Real I quick, didn't know Real quick note on the session, because obviously the last two sessions we've seen, it's always, are you always audio? Are you always getting everything just stemmed out audio? Do you get some things where they'll give you a session and there's still MIDI or virtual instruments or something in the session? No, it's always stemmed out audio. Sometimes I even get just a two-track, and then I have to mix vocals to just a two-track. That's fun. What's the, what, what's the, how do you... How do you manage that? I mean, you ever have somebody just give you the MP3 two track and you don't even get a, a wave file? So what do you like, you know, you just kind of- Fun times. Just um, deal with it? Yeah, usually you just gotta roll with it. If, if that's what you have to work with, you just gotta, you know, make the best of it. Usually, in most cases, they usually sound good or sound decent enough for me to do what I do to make it, you know, um, friendly for distribution type thing. Um, every now and then, there'll be a case where I have to mix from a two-track, and the two-track sounds awful, and I will then appeal to the artist or the person. Like, it, I've had one situation, probably in, that, in the past couple of years, where I had to be like, look, this, this ain't gonna work. Yeah, I gotta do better or find a better file for me to work from. Was it because it was just a, like a, a least beat that they got, or was it? it was, no, it was just too distorted. And distortion is something, once it's there, it's there. So in terms of getting the MP3, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking if somebody paid, you know, for uh, exclusive use for a beat, I don't know, whatever, 500 bucks, maybe they'd get it tracked out, but for some reason they just had the MP3. Like, could that be the case? Or if yeah, you figure I, by the time you would get it, you would get the... Yeah, I don't be knowing. I, I don't even be wanting to know all that. Like, <laughs> you just let it go, yeah. I'd leave me out of it, just, you know. Cool, yeah. cool. <laughs> so, um, yes, let's take another question. You. What's up, Leslie? Uh, it's Farrell. Um, I spoke to you yesterday in the Q&A. I remember. You remember? I bet. Um, about like learning like how to mix on my own, because when I mix my vocals, and I told you how I like, use a cross-reference, I'll take a track that's already on the platform. So a lot of times, nine times out of ten, I will listen to um, Uzi's album, because I love the mixing on there. So props to you on there. Appreciate that. Uh, so I was wondering, because I believe in signs, that's the reason I came here. I was wondering if it's possible. Can you show like, I know you said Uzi will send you something and be like, oh, I already like the, the reverb on there and stuff. Can you show me like how you like, how you place your compression on there, like how you put your reverb, like how, how you layer your stuff like as far as like, or can you Layer on top of what he sent? Yeah. I don't like, layer, I, that's the point. I just, I keep literally, so let's, let's look through it. So, and unfortunately, some of the plugins don't come up, but I, I can actually walk you through most of it. So sure. this is his vocal, let's go, ah. So let's go here. So this vocal, let's start with this vocal, right? Um, 
Maybe we can understand what he's talking about in this process. <laughs> yeah, do a little solo. Just I literally it. when it's funny when I when I got the um, files and I it was time to do the clean versions. I had to ask my interns to tr do the clean versions for me because I didn't know what he what was saying and saying. like. I'm like, maybe he's speaking y'all. Lawrence, did I have to ask y'all to do that too? Or that was before, that was, um, that was, I think, somebody else before y'all though. But yeah, I, I couldn't do it. Uh. That's all right. It's all right. Let's all day you ride a sled. I do want that. My really hurt me. I really hurt me, no. <laughs> Come on, wait. I'm, I'm going to get to your question in a yeah, minute. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Real talk, y'all. Like, <laughs> we are in the trust tree, right? We, we trust each other in here? We good? What is he saying? He said my Britney got mad. Oh, is that, is I'm barely her man? Oh, uh. See, y'all got a debate. Like, yeah, <laughs> hold on. That's all right. It's all right. That's all day you ride a sled. I do want that. My Britney, I'm mad. I'm really her man, no. Okay, you over there, Mountain. Stand up to the mic for two seconds. Come on. Tell me what he said. My Britney got mad. Everybody got the same swag now. I thought you just said it's all right. It said off white. And said, do you ride a sled? I didn't want that. My Britney got mad. Every I'm barely her man now. I'm barely her man now. My, My Britney got, got mad. Everybody, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Exclude her. She wasn't even supposed to be there. <laughs> so, my point is proven. Okay. Now, let's get back to your question. I just wanted to know that, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. So, anyway, so what you're hearing now. Yeah. Hear those delays when I yeah. stop it? Yeah. All that stuff was on there when he sent it. Oh, where are I didn't put those on there. He was like, I want my vocals to sound exactly like this. Oh, right. And sometimes when you're mixing the record, that's the thing. You have to honor what that artist wants. And I didn't touch any of those effects. I didn't move the reverb numbers, like all this stuff. This is probably a compressor. That was on there, just like that. Those settings, that's his. And even we come down here, the de -esser, all that's his stuff. I ain't had nothing to do with that. So, because I was honoring what he wanted, he wanted his vocals to sound exactly like he sent them. And then my job was really, I was mixing the beat. The mixing the beat? Yeah, I was worrying about the kicks and the, and the 808s and all that stuff. That, sh that bump. Oh, I, yeah, I yeah, see I it, could, yeah. I had a clean version. Clean right version, there. clean yeah. version. I appreciate you. <laughs> Next question over here. What's good, bro? What's my up? name Larry. Salute to you. You the GOAT. Now. <laughs> I'm from Philly, right? So, free me. I seen Uzi come up, you feel me? Mixing his emo, gritty styles Philly sound with the Atlanta bounce trap sound. So, this song, EXO Tour Life, is his biggest song to date, you feel me? It got nominated for a Grammy. So, you mean, just seeing that is one, pure motivation, and two, I wanna know, like, how did you take that in consideration? Did you, would you, um, doing Half a Lover's Rage 2, did you reference the first Lover's Rage, knowing that that's, the, that's his project that got him on and created that whole sound for him for, for you to cultivate the sound for the second project? Yes, and exactly, exactly what you just said is kind of reminiscent of the conversation I had with Cannon, where Cannon right. was like, we have to find a way to make sure he's representing both uh, regions. Right. And so that's, that's good that you observed that, because that's exactly yeah. what Cannon was trying to you know, emulate and, and portray is, yeah. is making sure that he's authentic, but he lives in the A. And, you know, that's what the sound that they're trying to do. So right. it's about how you can honor both things and not be disrespectful to each region, you know, so perfect. Right, yeah. yo, that's what's up that you like, that you did that. Like, that's, that's heavy. <laughs> Salute. Appreciate it. All right. Hey, so my name's uh, Alex Picard. Um, I actually don't have a uh, degree, or I'm not in the uh, musical degree program. I'm actually in game design. I'm just sort of that's fine. leeching as a hobbyist. Um, <laughs> I noticed when I try and make music um, in my free time, 
when I go back to it, it all kind of sounds the same. Um, and I don't mean like it's like a, like when you're working on an album, obviously you want all the music to have like send, like, uh, um, like you want it to send like a cohesive feel, like, like you want the messages to be the same, you want the music sort of to fit that same message. How can I go about making sure when I work on a, a new simple track that it's, it's like I'm not falling into the same traps of, oh, this sounds the same because I made the same mistakes because we all have sort of those idiosyncrasies where like even if we look at rap, uh, you can take a track from like Kendrick Lamar, one dude will love it, but his best friend will be like, I like it, but something's off to it. Like, so how can I go through and make sure I'm not like liking the same sounds or rejecting the same sounds so when I'm done with it, I'm not basically making the same thing as I did the last time? I'm um, just changing your palette. So, for instance, if you created something with a certain set of sounds, um, sometimes it's something as simple as changing your environment, where you do the track, if you have that ability. You know, we're a lot more mobile um, society now. Change your environment. Come on, like if you always do your beats on a laptop at the crib, come to campus and do a beat and see if that changes. You know, your environment might inspire you differently or change your palette of sounds. Only pick a certain amount of sounds to do one thing and then when you're done, don't use any of the sounds that you used last time and just switch it up and you may create differently. All right, appreciate it, thank you. No problem. One more question. Hey, how you doing today? I'm good, how are you? Good, I'm sorry, my voice is a little raspy, so don't mind me, I'm sorry. It's all good. Um, again, I'm Nicole Cash, an R&B artist here at Full Sail. Um, my ma majoring in recording arts. My question is not uh, solely towards uh, tour life, but uh, I just want to know, like, what do you do for artists that, that, you know, when they're not in the studio, when they're not, like, in the, like, by the mic, like, about to record, they nail something, but then when they get in there to record, it, like, it, it sounds trash, or, like, you know, like, something just go wrong, like, they nail it when they're not in there, but then when they get in there, they, you know. Uh, that's a common thing. I do that the, a lot. Yeah, and the fix, <laughs> the fix for that, and this may help you, is what it is, is it's something in your mind. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, we as human beings are programmed to like, like, you know how you could wake up super late every day when you got something to do, and then when you got a day off, you wake up kind of early? Because we innately don't want to have to do something. So mm -hmm. the stigma of going in the booth and being in the sterile environment and people watching you and people expecting something great to come out of your mouth as opposed to when you're just chilling in the room. Yeah. There's no expectation. Da, da, da. You can do things to curb some of that. So I'll give you a perfect example. Erica Badu was like that. She would sing some of the greatest stuff in the control room. She'd get in the booth and she would freeze up and she would forget words and it would just drive her nuts. So she started just recording in the control room. You can record in the control room. It's a sterile environment. It's still sound worthy and everything. The engineer just got to wear headphones and be quiet, but other than that, and just kick everybody out. Or have elements, cr try to create the environment that makes you comfortable, which is you don't have the pressure. Right. So, and a lot of times it could be the person you're working with. If it's somebody who you know isn't casting judgment on every word that comes out of your mouth, and you're, you have, you, the, the whole point of being an artist is you want the safe space to create. You want that safe space of no judgment. So... Just try to create that space and try singing your stuff in the control room. Mm -hmm. That usually works. Most artists who go through that, mm -hmm. the simple switch. They just bring them in the control room. Lawrence seen it a top of times with artists where we'll record them in the little room as opposed to sending them in the booth. And a lot of times they're a lot more comfortable and it's more organic and you know. So just try that simple thing and that might work. Thank you so much. So now, we, we got we are, 45 we seconds. End. You gotta okay. give the two things. 45 seconds? Damn. All right, so I got, I, I got to stand up for this one. <laughs> so I got, I got a couple things that I really wanted that were on my heart, and I wanted to use every forum this week while I'm on campus to address. It has nothing to do with any of this. Do y'all feel like we covered a lot of the mixing and the techniques and the questions and da-da-da? All right, so the two things I want to cover is, actually, it's one topic, but it's two things within this topic. You're networking your networking skills. There are two things that have been bothering me to no end this week. And so, like I said, I wanna use the platform to kind of communicate to y'all. A lot of students will come up to me and say, hey man, what can I do better to network? And 
the first thing I want to say, and I just don't know how to be polite about it, take a shower. And I'm being very serious. The hygiene... The hygiene situation, the hygiene situation is important because you can't expect an employer to take you seriously. You can't come to a career networking event smelling like last week. It's ridiculous, and the hygiene situation is important. You have to understand that you are perpetuating your brand. You are saying to the world, you know, I want you to hire me. I wouldn't want to hire you if I don't even want to be around you because you smell bad or your breath smell bad or, you know. So really, I want y'all to take your hygiene seriously. That's the first thing. The second thing is one thing I'm noticing from a lot of students. If I'm standing, if it's me, and then it's Tremaine, my fellow Hall of Famer who's getting inducted this year, and an employee from Full Sail. And y'all can tell the employees who work at Full Sail because of the color of their um, neck thing, correct? Student will come up to me, this never fails, all week. Hey, how you doing? I'm so-and-so, I wanna introduce myself to you. Every now and then, they'll introduce themselves to Tremaine. They never introduce themselves to the, the employee. And that's a huge mistake in networking. When you walk into a social circle of people, introduce yourself to everybody you don't know. Because that person, that you didn't introduce yourself to, that full sale employee that you didn't introduce yourself to could be the course director for the course you're struggling or the person who can help you get a job when you leave here. That could be your career dev rep or a financial aid person who could have helped you with a problem that you, you know, it's important. And that's one thing I really wanted to convey to y'all is don't skip the full sale employee they are actually the most important person in that circle because they're the person you're going to have the most proximity with. I leave in a, in a few weeks, and I don't know when I'm going to be back, but that person works here. Get to know the people around you. Get to know how these people can help you. I was standing next to, this, this is a trip, and yes, you can appreciate this. So yesterday, right, I'm in a circle of people. It's Dave Franco, Ken Goldstone, and me. And this young lady walked up to him, she only introduced herself to me. Wow. And for those of you who don't know Dave Franco or Ken Goldstone is, do your research. These are people you might want to know. So that's all I had to say, and I really wanted to make sure that y'all knew that. And <clears throat> on that note, you know, I just, I, I'll, I'll say this from my perspective, but first and foremost, thank everybody here for being here. All, everybody online, thanks for being here. But thank you too, because you're not only an inspiration to all the students and, and fans, but you're an inspiration to myself and other instructors to look out there and see you doing your thing and doing it for so long. You know, that's a big deal. So big round of applause to you guys. Thank you so much.